Hi, I'm so glad you're here with us today. We have Dr. Marty Greer, Director of Veterinary Services with Revival Animal Health joining us to talk about the latest with the COVID-19 or coronavirus outbreak that our nation and really the world is working with and working through right now. Um, at Revival, we've taken steps to make sure that we continue to be there for you and your pets. Right. Um, our pet care pros continue to answer the phones. They are there six feet away from each other. We've arranged the office settings a little bit, but they are still there. That friendly voice will answer the phone, answer your questions, and of course, be sure to get your orders placed so your pets can get the products they need to stay healthy and happy. Let's now talk with Dr. Greer. A lot of people are confused. There's a lot of misconceptions out there regarding this because we're all familiar with coronavirus in dogs and cats, but this is a different thing. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, and at this point, there's no indication that COVID-19 has any influence on our dogs and cats. And there's no indication that any of the coronaviruses that our dogs and cats have been in our populations for many years will influence our health. So we've known about FIP, feline infectious peritonitis, and the coronavirus in the cat since the 1950s. And in no time has that ever had any appearance of mutating and causing any human disease. Uh, the dog coronavirus came around sometime in the 1990s. Again, no indication of human spread. And in 2003, it was discovered that there's a canine respiratory coronavirus and recently also a feline respiratory coronavirus. But again, none of those have any influence on our health. They don't spread to us from our pets and we can't spread anything we have, uh, whether it's coronavirus or many other viruses to our pets. So we're pretty safe coexisting. Right. Now, I know a lot of people are concerned, can the COVID-19 be transferred to their pet? Do they need to be concerned about that? And there was re one report, I believe it was a Pomeranian, in uh, Hong Kong that the dog uh, did test positive on an oral and nasal swab, but not on the rectal swabs. Uh, it did live in a home with uh, an owner that was ill with COVID-19. Um, even though they found the viral particles, the dog was never ill. They retested the dog. The dog uh, has cleared the virus. And as I understand it, I believe the dog has now passed away, but he was 17. And I believe they removed him from the family, from the owner. And I can't really imagine how many other disorders the 17 year old Pomeranian would have had. So there's no indication that this dog was ill from the COVID-19 virus. It looks like it was an unfortunate set of circumstances that the whole thing kind of turned out that way. But we have no other cases. That's been the only one reported and there's been no other cases where anyone has even remotely thought that there was a dog or cat influencing um, the transmission of the disease. Absolutely. Now, what about the coronavirus vaccine? A lot of people, you know, hear about that, like, hey, there's a coronavirus vaccine for dogs. Can I use that on myself? Can I use that on my dog? Yeah. No, is the answer. <laughs> right. And there's no reason to change the vaccination protocol you've been using for your dog. If you have been using coronavirus vaccine in the kennel, um, there is a coronavirus that causes a GI syndrome and especially young puppies are around three weeks of age. So if it's been appropriate for your veterinarian to recommend that, you should continue that. But there's no reason to start vaccinating for coronavirus if you never have and you've never had an outbreak. Um, the same with the cats with coronavirus. There is an FIP vaccine. It's available as an intranasal. The dog is an injectable. Uh, but neither of those are, are approved for use in humans, should be used in humans, or um, any anything even remotely similar to that. Um, they have started testing vaccines in people. I saw on television the first dose of coronavirus being administered, but we're probably a year away from one of those products being released to the uh, general public for preventing the disease. It's new. It's, mm -hmm. it's very new, and to have a vaccine and a test available this early is pretty impressive. Absolutely. Now, what about the symptoms? You know, we've all heard on the news about COVID-19, the symptoms of that human coronavirus are, you know, shortness of breath, the fever and the coughing, but really coronavirus in dogs and cats, it's completely different symptoms as well. Yeah, um, there is a respiratory form. They've just recently reported in cats that they think there's a respiratory form, but it usually coexists with some of the other upper respiratory diseases in the cat. And the same with the dog. In the dog, it's part of the CIRD, the canine infectious respiratory disease complex, which goes along with herpes, bordetella, parainfluenza, adenovirus, 
Um, and there's probably a number of other viral and bacterial diseases that our dogs can get um, that, can, that can cause respiratory disease. What they haven't talked about on the human side, and I'm, I'm frankly a little bit surprised, is they haven't talked about co-infections. Now, there's a difference between co-infections and comorbidities. A comorbidity would be something like you have diabetes, you have um, pulmonary embolism, you have some other pre-existing disease that may make you more susceptible to coronavirus or a more severe form of the coronavirus. But they haven't really talked about when you, whether any of these people that are sick or especially if they've passed away from coronavirus, if they've had co-infections from influenza A or some of the others. And we know in dogs and cats that those co-infections really significantly worsen the disease. So there is a respiratory form in the dog and cat, tends to be pretty mild, they tend not to run a fever, they may have a cough, but they tend not to have pneumonia or some of the other disorders that they're describing in people. And then there's the GI form, which can cause um, vomiting and diarrhea, a combination of those in in um, dogs and in cats. In cats, up to 90% of the cats just walking around your house right now have antibodies to coronavirus, indicating that at some point they were exposed. And then there is a mutation in the cat uh, called FIP, feline infectious peritonitis, which is initiated by a coronavirus that mutates and causes an unusual form, not particularly rare because we do see it in veterinary practices regularly, uh, but there is an FIP uh, form that causes a fluid accumulation in the lungs, in the abdomen, in the uh, pl pleural cavity, or can cause a dry form as well that cause granulomatous lesions in the kidney, the liver, and so forth. So we can see a number of different forms of this disease, but the respiratory form tends to be much milder than the form of respiratory disease we're seeing in people at this point. Okay. Now, hand washing. Obviously, oh. it's become part of <laughs> all of our routines. I feel like I wash my hands about every three minutes now. Um, yeah. But in addition to hand washing, what other things, you know, in order to keep your kennel and your pet's cages and all of those kind of things clean and sanitary for both your health and obviously the pet, the pet's health as well. Sure. And it's really a two-step process. The first step is to wash the surface. So you can use any kind of a detergent. You can use a dish soap. You can use a number of different detergents. Um, there are many of them available on the veterinary side, the, the ones on the human side as well. So the first thing you need to do is wash the surface to remove any organic material, meaning mucus, um, blood, debris, dirt, um, diarrhea, any kind of body fluid, that first needs to be eliminated because a disinfectant won't work with the organic material present. And what you don't want to do is aerosolize that organic material. So if you're spraying down a surface, you don't want to just spray and you know stand back. Like if you've got a pile of fecal material, you don't want to spray into it because that's just going to aerosolize all those and then it's going to be even a worse situation. So pick up the large pieces of organic material, then use your soap to clean it. And then once that's done, use the disinfectant and you want to use the disinfectant in two ways. One is according to the label instructions for dilution. So dilute it according to the label for that particular disease you're trying to manage. And some different disinfectants will have different amounts depending on what disease you're trying to disinfect for. So parvo may be different than corona. So read your label, follow the instructions, measure it. So don't just kind of splash some in the bucket and think you've got the right amount. Measure the amount of water, measure the amount of disinfectant, be really you know, careful with your calculations, and don't mix other products in that because you can get, unfortunately, pretty nasty fumes if you mix bleach or certain other um, disinfectants with things that shouldn't be mixed together. So number one, watch your dilution, and number two, watch your contact time because it will tell you how long that product needs to be in contact with the surface before it's rinsed off or before it runs off to adequately disinfect the area. So some of these surfaces need to be in contact for five minutes. It may need to be 30 minutes. Um, and some of them do have some residual effect as well. So again, read your labels and see how long it's good for so you can determine how often you need to rewipe surfaces. There's commercials on TV right now showing that some of the products last for 24 hours, but they don't all. So read your label, read your label. And if I didn't mention it, read your label. <laughs> Absolutely. Good advice there. Now, what if you do come down with COVID-19? You know, oh, what, yeah. what advice do you have there? Do you need to stay away from your pets? Do you, should you not, you know, a lot of people have their pets sleep with them at night in their beds right. and lick right. them and all of that kind of stuff. You know, right. what, what do you need to do? Sure, and the official statement from the Center for Disease Control, the world's small animal veterinary association, 
Association and the World Health Organization, I'll say there's never been any case of a dog or a cat that's transmitted the disease to a human, but they're still also saying if you're ill, you should avoid contact with your pet. Now, it seems to me that this is the time you need contact with your pet the most. So if you have a, a bed buddy that's willing to sleep with you at a time that no one else in your family <laughs> wants to even be in the room with you, that might be your best companion. But be aware that licking there's always a concern that they could pick up the, the viral particles and transmit those to someone else. So you should be a little bit aware of that, but I think you should still spend time with your pet. I think that's when you need them the most is when you're the sickest. So hang out with them, just be smart about it. And of course, anytime anyone has handled a pet, whether it's the pet themselves or the leash or the collar or the bulls or any of those things that the pet has come in contact with, you should wash your hands with antibacterial soap before you move on to making your sandwich. I would say that anytime. I mean, I work in the veterinary industry. I can't tell you how many times a day I wash my hands. I don't go treat a pet and then go have a sandwich. So be thoughtful about your hygiene. We always should be. We should be not touching our faces. We should not be doing some of the things that we've gotten pretty casual about in our society. So just good old basic personal hygiene goes a really long way in saving us from a lot of these illnesses. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for answering these questions and some misconceptions that people have. And if you do have more questions about coronavirus or COVID-19 or your pet's health in general, we want you to let you know that our Revival Pet Care Pros, they are still working. They are there. They are answering the phones. You know, if you call Revival, you'll get that same friendly voice that you've come to expect. So, you know, don't don't shy away. You know, we are here to help. We're all here in this together. And so let's, let's work together and we will all get through this. Thank you again, Dr. Greer for joining us today. Thank you.